Hello and a very warm welcome to this exclusive webinar around building a data-driven culture in the non-profit sector. Today's event is hosted by Public Sector Executive and brought to you in collaboration with Salesforce.org. It's great to see so many names joining our audience. The term data-driven culture has been a prominent feature in an ever-changing digital world with the ability to analyze data and transform the nonprofit sector. With the digital first approach changing how nonprofits operate, how can third sector organizations deliver personalized, meaningful engagement to supporters and recipients through adopting a data driven culture? Well, in this webinar, we'll give you through, we'll talk you through what nonprofit leaders need to navigate and highlight the positive steps that you can take towards a data driven culture. We've got some impressive guests lined up on our virtual stage, and I'm sure their input, experience and thoughts will lead to a fascinating discussion. Today, of course, is not just about us talking to you. It's designed to be a conversation. I'd like to encourage you to get involved and ask questions of our guests using our live Q&A function. I'll keep an eye on what's coming in throughout and open up the floor to you once our debate gets underway. So today's theme is around the term data-driven culture, but what does it actually mean? Why is it important to you in the third sector? And how can it help you improve your organization's outputs? Our ability to analyze data and transform the nonprofit sector is becoming increasingly relevant in our digital world, uncovering vital new insights and information which have never before been so accessible. We can deliver more personalized, meaningful engagement to supporters and recipients through smart use of data. But you don't have to take my word for it. To give you a rich insight into the power of data for the nonprofit sector, I'm delighted to be joined by Mark Harrowood, Chief Data Officer at UNICEF. We're hoping to be joined by Elspeth Solly shortly, who's the ICT lead at Mac charity which provides healthy school breakfasts to disadvantaged children at risk of hunger here in the UK. We've also got with us Gerard McGovern, CIO of Guide Dogs, and Santosh Cavallio, Director of Digital Transformation and Innovation at Salesforce.org. So uh, thank you, Mark, Gerard, and Santosh for joining us, and uh, welcome to our virtual stage. I always think it's a nice and interesting way to start off by uh, hearing a little bit about uh, you know, giving everybody a minute or two to introduce themselves. And uh, Mark, you're UNIF UNICEF's first ever Chief Data Officer, appointed in January this year. Tell us a bit about you and, and how you hope to change children's lives through data. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. And uh, I, I am... Um... I picked up a term a couple of years ago. I, I call myself now a factivist. So I, I have a deep passion for making sure that we can get the data and other evidence that are needed to be able to make a change. I, I, I have had some philosophical discussions with people about whether data have a value in their own right, or if they only have a value when they make a difference in other people's lives. And uh, to me, I'm, I'm way on that side. If it's not making a difference, then I don't care if it's good data or uh, a, you know wonderfully collected. So I've been working in UNICEF for over a quarter of a century in a lot of different uh, countries in different uh, regions of the world. I started in UNICEF in, in the mid-90s uh, in this unit now, and I've come a big circle uh, back to, to be able to lead it. And we've changed um, so that we no longer just look at uh, just, but, you know, look at statistical data, but to broaden this. Uh, so now we have the chief data officer role to see how we can bring other kinds of data together to increase the power of all data to make a bigger difference in the lives of children. I love that term, actually. I, I read in some notes that you call yourself a factivist, and uh, that's, a, that's a phrase I think I'm going to steal from you. I love the fact you've come full circle as well, Mark. So thank you for giving us an introduction. Um, Gerard, I know that you're also absolutely passionate about digital and data, and you're at Guide Dogs. So tell us a bit about what you do and, and how you utilize that data. Um, I'm certainly going to steal the factivist line. So <laughs> thank you, Mark, for introducing that. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm at Guide Dogs and data for us is really important on a number of levels. Um, 
I would say I'm, I'm obsessed with data, but that has connotations I don't think I want to be associated with. But data tells us about our dogs. So we have uh, DRM, which people think is digital rights management, but we call that dog relationship management. So we have a data on our dogs, data on, on our um, service users and data on our donors as well, and also data on, on pretty much everything else in between. So for us, having that ability to really find the nuggets of information that that exists in that data is so important um and i think it's we're we're very lucky that we partner with companies like salesforce who enable us to really truly truly use our data and it is as, as mark said it really is an asset to the organization um, and i think that's the biggest change that's probably happened in the last five to ten years that people really do see it as such an important asset um, it, and it's, it's interesting, it's, isn't it, with Gerard? It's something that we, as sort of punters, if you like, or supporters of guide dogs, don't really see. I had no idea that you were so digitally clued up there. We're we're getting there. I don't think any anyone's perfect. Um, we're we're all on a journey here, but but data it, it's it's so important because we want to be able to engage with people. We want to be able to give people relevant, timely information so that people continue to support with us and that we can give the the best help and support to our to our service users and, and people who are visually impaired. So yes, data for us is crucial in that. And of course, that's the uh, that's the end game, isn't it? Really, that's the important thing that you're giving the best service you can. Uh, Santos, you've been waiting there patiently. You've got uh, an very impressive CV, which includes ten years' experience in guiding senior executives in their digital transformation in large enterprises all over the world. Uh, love to hear a bit about you in your own words, and also what you bring to Salesforce too. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I don't have a pithy catchphrase like Mark does to describe my job, although, uh, like Jared, I'm tempted to steal that. My role involves helping our sort of large enterprise organizations transform using technology. And at the heart of that sits the question of what are you going to do when you get the technology, uh, which builds up a body of data? What would you like to do with it? What are the types of experiences you want to deliver to a variety of stakeholders? Um, I've done this role in the commercial world uh, in the last three years of exclusively focused on not-for-profits um, like the ones we've represented. And I guess the most impactful part of the job is not thinking about what information can do from the organization internally. It's actually looking at it from an outside-in perspective and asking about what difference, and I think Mark alluded to that earlier, what difference can it make to a beneficiary, um, to a member of government if you're trying to create some advocacy, or even the, the public at large. So Really excited to be talking about this topic today. Well, I'd like to stay with you if I can, Santosh, to start off today's discussion. And how would you define then a data-driven culture? And how, in layman's terms, does that bring value to the non-profit sector? Let me take that question, those two questions in turn, uh, Helen. Starting with what we define as the culture, I think it'll be hard to provide an exact definition, but I can certainly provide the characteristics or the symptoms of an organization that has a living and breathing data-driven culture. And I think the first one is around how data is used in both strategic and operational decision-making. And I, I deliberately distinguish the two because organizations tend to be good at one or the other, seldom both of them. So an example of sort of operational decision-making that is driven by data might be a not-for-profit that decides to spin up a campaign to raise funds around a global event. It might be you know, the Australian bushfires, which are catastrophic at the end of 2019, was a trigger point for several environmental organizations to raise funds on the back of that. And I think a data-driven culture in this operational sense will not wait for the end of the campaign to reflect on how successful they were, vis-a-vis -vis the amount of money invested, the number of individuals that engaged with that campaign, how many might have contributed, how many might have signed up to be volunteers. They won't wait till the very end. They use information in an operational sense to tweak that campaign whilst it's happening. So a decision to say, you know, a new social media channel like TikTok's taking off, perhaps that's where we should respond because we're seeing greater levels of connection there. And likewise, we want to scale back our efforts on Facebook because we're not seeing as much response there. So that's, that's an example of the type of operational decision making that relies on data. The strategic one, and I think um, both Mark and Jared spoke about the strategic level of decision making, which says, let's reflect back on the information that we have within our organization through the interaction of these stakeholders to make macro decisions about the organization. So that might mean the types of programs and services you offer. Uh, in UNICEF's case, it might be the number of you know, the, the specific types of countries you might want to deliver your services, whether it's better delivered directly 
whether it's better to deliver through partners. So those macro decisions. So I think that for me is the first characteristic, the level of decision making and how data plays an influence there. Um, the second one is really about the internal way in which employees or staff members see their interaction with information. I guess an organization, if we took the opposite, which is an organization that doesn't have a data-driven culture, interacting with data is seen as a burden of the job. It's seen as something that's in addition to my day job. So if it was about, you know, to use an example of a individual that is working with a beneficiary in a particular country, if they see their job of recording that interaction in a system of some form as a burden, as opposed to something that's intrinsic as part of the job, we tend to see a difference in terms of how alive and well that culture is. Um, I look at us as an organization as Salesforce and just in what we do internally and how we serve our customers, I'd like to think we're a data-driven organization because we're not just mandated, we're very encouraged to not just record all our interactions, to derive insight for the next set of interactions we have based on the information that's already there. So if I were to talk to Gerard's organization, Guide Dogs, my first port of call is to look at what information we hold already about guide dogs before I, I'd embark on a conversation. Um, and the third symptom, uh, and you know, the, or third characteristic in, of an organization that's got a strong data-driven culture is about leaders. Leaders in those organizations demand, expect, and actually enact the behaviors they expect to see. So as an example, they would evaluate performance through data they would rely on that through a significant, um, that, to a significant extent to make decisions about how individuals are performing in the organization. They wouldn't rely, for instance, on a personal secretary, on a personal assistant or an executive assistant to put together a report might, that might take that individual weeks and months. They pretty much in real time will have their fingers on the pulse of the information they require. So they're very on top of things in terms of data. So I'd say those three characteristics to me are symptomatic of a data-driven culture. And um, Mark, what about the characteristics for you with UNICEF as, as the backdrop as opposed to Salesforce? I think Santosh gave us a very eloquent description of what the data-driven culture means means to him in his world, but just wondering how, how that sits in yours. Yeah, no, thanks. And you know, it, it's, it's funny how they're different and yet they're very similar. So it is, um, so the way I would think of it for us, okay, so UNICEF's a $7 billion a year organization. And a lot of that money goes to uh, helping deliver services. I mean, with partners, but delivering services. So, <clears throat> so that clearly uh, has to be data driven uh, because we need to make sure that we're delivering efficiently and effectively and in the right place and so on and so on, which has all sorts of problems. But anyway, that, so that's one side of it. So that's perhaps um, akin to what Santosh was saying about operational. But um, another important part of our job, which absorbs less of the funding, but uh, certainly in my opinion, has the more longer term effect, is uh, what we call evidence-based advocacy. So the majority of money that is spent on children in the world is from national governments. Uh, there's aid, there's, there's cooperation, there's, there's private sector and so on, but the, the vast majority is the government. So how can we help the governments to be using that money most effectively uh, to, to uh, help children grow and thrive. And so uh, we, we need evidence, a lot of which is based on data, to be able to uh, advocate for particular policies or to give advice about how well policies are running, uh, are there better ways of running the program so they can reach more children or, or, or help children more effectively? So that's in some ways more like the strategic uh, level that, that Santosh was talking about. Uh, and, and we need both. And um, as Santosh was saying, it's, it's difficult to do both because they're very different kinds of mindsets that are, are behind it. Uh, and, and that's why we created one of the reasons we created this chief data officer role is to bring these together and to say there are data which are needed for some and for the other. And a lot of the data, if you bring it together, is going to be more powerful for both of those uh, kinds of actions. <clears throat> so that's that's how we're looking at uh, uh, data driven, evidence driven uh, culture in UNICEF. Gerard, do feel free to add to Santosh and Mark's comments there. But also I'm wondering as well how we bring everybody along with us on this data journey? So it's a really good point. I would completely echo what uh, Santosh and Mark have said. I think to pick up on one thing Santosh said about feeling that it's a burden to, to enter this data, I think that's a, it's a really important point on two aspects. That First of all, we all need to do 
a better job of explaining the importance of data. Um, there's generally there's three reasons why we we do things at the guide dogs or across all organisations. It's going to increase value. Um, it's going to make us more efficient. Or to be very blunt, if we don't do it, we're going to be in trouble and end up in jail. And I, I quite like not being in jail, as as do most of my colleagues. So. It's about explaining that, that sometimes we, we, we have to do these things, but also it's about then explaining what the benefit is when you do them. So above and beyond just the, the regulatory side, the fact that we can help more people, the fact that every time we create more value or we become, become more efficient, more people are being helped. So that's really important. But on the flip side, as technologists, we need to make sure that what we create is as easy to use as possible. And certainly being a guide dogs where accessible technology is incredibly important to us. And it's not just about being accessible, it has to be usable. So simply because you can log onto a system does not mean it's a usable and user-friendly system. So if we really want to get the best data in, we've got to create the best and easiest to use systems to get that data in there. The, the other steps we, we can work on, but if you're not getting good data in to start with and people don't see the value of it, you're, you're never going to succeed. And how do you make sure, Gerard, that nobody loses out? Before we started today's webinar, we were talking about my blind friend, Amal Latif, who people may remember because he was the semi-finalist in, um, in the cooking program, celebrity cooking program, and he's been blind since he was 18. So it's interesting to see how he receives his emails and his data. How do you make sure that your blind and partially sighted um, people that are part of Guide Dogs don't lose out on that journey? So it's sometimes very hard. We, we can, things we develop ourselves, we have an awful lot of control over, but we are, we're sometimes beholden to external partners. I, I will say, not just because they're involved in this, in this uh, webinar, Salesforce are excellent. We have a great relationship with Salesforce. They have an accessible technology team. Um, same with companies like Microsoft and Apple as well. So when we are dealing with companies like that, it's, it's not easy. It's still, it's, there's still challenges, but it's far easier than I can tell a story of um, we were trying to procure an HR system. And part of that is um, allowing people to apply for a role. And when you were filling out the boxes for your name, address, et cetera, it produced a pop-up, which is a little bit 1995, but we'll, we'll let that one go. Who um, <laughs> use screen readers. So the head and have the screen read out what is on the screen. They, they couldn't see, in inverted commas, the pop-up. The response we got back was, well, if they enter the information correctly, then they're able to proceed. And it's, it's for someone who's in, in the sector and lives and breathes this, it's just an incredible, naive answer. So, yes, we have challenges, but at the same time, we also have to educate people. And it's the same with security we're on the same sort of journey go back 10 years ago people built a product and then thought about security later that definitely isn't the case now security is there by design and we all know it's there by design because it's cheaper doing it when you build the product rather than trying to fix it later the same is true of accessibility if you make your product available to all then you've already done the hard work it's really easy doing it at the start but it is it is sometimes tough sometimes we we have to procure systems that are not as accessible as as they should be because we have to choose the the best of a very bad bunch. But it's something I'm incredibly passionate about. Celebrity MasterChef was the show that just slipped my mind there. Uh, <laughs> Santosh, uh, I'd like to hear later on a bit about a bit about the support for guide dogs, actually. Um, but in the meantime, how do we develop and then sustain a data driven culture? What are your thoughts? So, sorry, Santosh, what are your thoughts on sustaining that culture? I think it starts with leaders uh, to be able to set the examples up. I, I'm sort of always taken aback at the number of organizations that will come to us and ask us for advice on potentially things that are not going wrong. And they quickly identify or they think they've identified the root causes in terms of either the technology or even in terms of the skill sets within the organization. But actually, it starts by a willingness to change behaviors that are led by leaders. and um, not just in those operational strategic decisions that I spoke about, but even in the behavior they embody in using it. So as a you know, very, very small example, our leader for our organization sets the tone because 
before, you know, when he needs to be briefed for a particularly important meeting. So Davos is coming up. Uh, it's on the agenda for a number of different organizations. He'll be meeting several organizations. He will refuse to be, you know, in any meeting unless there's some evidence-based data that, that's derived from our system, our, our information that we hold about those customers before he interacts with them. You know, anything people say about, you know, I think or I believe, he'll sort of catch those phrases and say, great, tell me what informs that belief or that thought, um, without which you'll refuse to progress. So that, you know, that's just one example of the type of leadership. The second is, I think, what Jared mentioned, I can't echo that enough. As technologists, I think, you know, I'll hold my hand up there too. There's There's been a failure in the industry to communicate, I guess, the importance of this um, in terms of enabling work to be done in a different way. So the idea of interacting with data being seen as a burden or being seen as someone else's job, the technology department's job or a data team, I think that's been a failure. I think part of sustaining a culture of, uh, of really high levels of useful data use is about constantly educating on the value, not just for that individual's role, because at some level, the value to that role will be met very easily. And then you're still gonna ask that person to do something more in relation to the information. But really their, contrib their contribution to the entire organization's impact and performance. I think that's... So I think you asked me the question at the top, what's the value of this data-driven culture? Mark touched on it. I think Jared touched on it. It's better outcomes. It's lower costs in a way. So, you know, you're much more informed in where uh, the money is being spent. Therefore, you're much more effective in delivering the outcomes. And it might be different things for different organizations. So I think those two things, leadership, as well as uh, really strong communication of the value of changing behaviors and working in a different way is really important in sustaining that culture. Um, Dorcas, thank you, Dorcas, has just contributed on the live Q&A and says, I agree with Gerard, the data has to be simple for some organizations to use them. We have to remember some small organizations are just catching up with IT systems. Apart from educating people, the company has to offer support. Um, Mark, when we have too much data, I'm guessing that there can be issues around bottlenecks. And I wonder if you can just talk about that and what are some of the common bottlenecks in a data-driven culture will certainly that that you come across uh yeah i i can i'm actually going to steal a little bit of, of some of the other questions that perhaps to lead into you that uh, thank you um because uh we data people are forever putting out data um what we're not good at is necessarily creating the demand for that data uh, for those data or communicating them in a way that people um can hear it and can assimilate it, which which relates to that comment you just picked up off the off the Q and A. Mm. Uh, we we tend to put out data in a way that we understand and that we think, uh, but happily we are not normal, and and so we have to uh, get normal people to help us say, oh, this is what I want to know, um, and uh, and that does apply to this 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 bottle. So I mean, in in some ways, that is a bottleneck is is. Uh, uh, kind of a culture gap in, in what we do, um, but also um, the, the excess of data. So I, I talk to you know a lot of people in our organization about data, and they either tell me they don't have enough data or they have too much data. And um, you know maybe it's uh, Goldilocks needs to come in and help us out here for to get the right uh, right amount of data. But the reason is that um, we have a lot of data that is generated by what we do. Um, when we deliver stuff, when we measure, you know, it's a lot, a lot of data. So number one is how do we manage that and bring it under control and, and get value from it so it's not just a mass of, of data that's overwhelming. But secondly, our, our, our gold dust is uh, reliable enough data that tell us what's happening in children's lives, you know, what is missing in children's lives or what challenges are they facing um, so that we can be targeting what we do. And, and so that's the gold dust. And, and what we're looking for is an alchemist who can who can take this mass of data and and glean knowledge from it to be able to inform um, the, the the kinds of data points we need to be able to be more effective, or for our policy advice and advocacy to be more effective. So it, it's it's both an, a glut and a, and a drought at the same time, which is um, an interesting conundrum. Mark, I just wonder, as a as a mum of two children myself, yeah. who are very very lucky, and you know know that they're very lucky when they see events going on around the world and some of the projects that UNICEF's involved in and supports. 
what is it that the gold dust can tell you? Can you give us a couple of examples of what kind of information the gold dust can tell you about children's lives, which then enables you as UNICEF to go and make a difference and help? Yeah, well, let's give an example. Um, so what we, okay, COVID on everybody's minds, obviously. Uh, it had a devastating effect on the education system in every country. I, I, you know, mum of two children, <laughs> you felt it too. Uh, yeah. Schools closed almost everywhere. Uh, and in some cases for a year or even more than a year. Uh, so what are the alternatives? The alternatives are some kind of remote learning. But um, who, you know, which children live in a house that has a computer and an internet connection or even a television um, or, or even a radio? And, and uh, if you don't know where uh, the, the, um, the facilities are to be able to do the remote learning, you don't know what kind of remote learning to do. And then did countries have a policy on remote learning? Did they have the training and the expertise available to be able to? Have... So we, we created an index we call the Remote Learning Index, um, which helps to identify where the gaps are so that uh, you know, heaven forfend it happens again. But, it, you know, it wasn't just COVID-19. In the uh, Ebola outbreaks in, in West Africa a few years ago, it was the same problem. Schools got closed and children were left with nothing. And once children have been out of school too long, they may never go back. So uh, what, you know, what is the what is the situation that means, OK, yeah, we can, can we can continue uh uh, giving lessons through uh, TV and maybe have a teacher going around once a week to be able to talk, you know. And so it by when you know what there is and what there isn't, then you can help design the program to be able to help uh, so that the children don't get too much harmed by what's going around them. That was a, a great example. Thank you. Um, Hemont's um, written, I found that the biggest problem for small voluntary organizations is A, where to find the data, B, how to access data, and C, once they find the data, how to analyze the data. I'm just wondering, Gerard, if that's something you can talk about as to whether you can give Hemont some sort of insight into, into how you cope at Guide Dogs with, with all that data, how to access it, how to analyze it. It's a, it is a difficult challenge. Um, I think there's been an evolution of of data, not just at guide dogs, but across the whole the whole technology and then every other sector. That I think we've gone from there's data that sits in people's heads, there's data that sits on pieces of paper and in whiteboards. There's probably the world's biggest store of data is Microsoft Excel, um, which is both a blessing and a curse. It's the it's the gateway drug into data as such um, and management of it. And it's both, it is both a blessing and a curse. And then there's structured uh, databases and structured CRM uh, programs and various products that link all in between. So depending on the size of the organization, it, it's an incredibly difficult and complex problem. Um, at, at Guide Dogs, we have data sitting in all four of those different places. And I think our our role is to make sure that effectively it's taking the the implicit that sits around various different sort of urban legends of, of guide dogs and making it explicit. Um, and it's, it's really difficult. It's, it's a really difficult problem to have. Um, picking up on Mark's point about can you have too much data? I think the answer is, and this is a real business school answer, so I apologise, it, it depends. <laughs> it really does. And I think it's it's more about how you manage it and how you give access to it. So, so one example is, I think the, the holy grail of freedom of access to data is that people have the ability to run their own reports. So rather than having to, to go to a centralized team and go put in a request, please can I have a report on, I don't know, the number of dogs called Dave or whatever, whatever data people want. <laughs> the holy grail is that people could do that themselves. But that really is a double-edged sword because if you've got an awful lot of data and people aren't trained and aware of the power of the tool that you are using and the power of the data that sits there, just because you produce a report and it produces a result you were looking for, that may not be, A, the question you should have asked, or B, you're not sure if the results are correct because there is sometimes that infinite trust that computer says yes. And actually, if you've selected the wrong field or you you haven't quite asked the right question, what we then don't want to have is people making organizational decisions on data that could be wrong. So access to data is really important, but it has to be backed up with 
with education in the same way we we wouldn't send out guide dogs to be trained with people who aren't aware of how to train a guide dog we've got to make sure that if we are giving people powerful tools that they are aware of what they can do and the impacts of those decisions and as santo says it stems down from right from the top people explaining this is the power of data and it all feeds through a couple of questions are coming in, Santosh, about resources, really. So Hammond finishes off his comment um, that I just put his question to Gerard, but says small voluntary groups have to include data for applying for funding to try and survive and provide the service to the community. And it's a difficult challenge when the organisations don't have resources. And Sandra also says, Santosh, as a person running a small organisation, the biggest issues are cost and availability of suitable systems. Everything is sales driven. What, what can people do when resources are a problem? Because there's a cost to all this too, isn't there? I'd like to actually begin with uh, picking up a thread of what Jared said, because I think it links to both the questions. Um, you know, Jared gave the example, and I completely agree that unless you're asking the right question, having access to a goldmine of data might be self-defeating or might even be dangerous. I think that there's a, there's a neat, you know, there's a antecedent question to that that's even more fundamental, which is, what are you capturing and why? Um, and I think until that's answered, I remember in, until that's answered, you're going to you're going to actually face troubles of constantly feeling overwhelmed with the nature of, you know, the the compliance requirements or even uh, you know governance requirements around access for funding. Like the question came in, I think what really was interesting in the commercial world was maybe four or five years ago, the holy grail was can we construct a single view of you, Helen, as the customer? So yeah. you ring up. A particular organization whether you ring up to buy something you talk to the sales department whether you ring up to complain about something so you end up in the service department or whether you've got a technical query about a particularly complex product and you end up with you know technical support so regardless of who you talk to they have a unified view of you such that they don't ask annoying and repetitious questions like you know uh, tell me your account number when you've already given that to them on, you know, tell me what, what your issues are when that's your third call and you've documented that in your second or third. Actually, what they found was to be able to serve that customer effectively, they began with the principle that let's capture everything possible about this customer. So let's ask them a plethora of questions. And then they found actually, this was meant to be the answer to our customer issues, but actually we started getting more customer complaints when we put such a system in. And the problem was they were just simply trying to capture too much. They went away from the, the really first principal idea is what is the minimum set of information we need to improve what we offer to them? So to come back to those questions now about you know, the, the complexity of what's being done, I, I don't take away that it's a complex task for any organization. I think the, the challenge many organizations get into is they kind of see shining examples either in the sector or across sectors and say, you know, I wish I could be like that. But I think that distracts from asking what does your organization need as a bare minimum information wise to stir, serve that stakeholder a little bit better. Start from that position. And depending on the size and scale of organization, as, as Jared said, it's a dirty word to some way to say Excel might be okay to begin with, depending on the size of your organization. But once you get to a certain size and scale, yes, you need something more secure, more scalable, more robust. Um, in terms of cost and availability, you know, Every, everyone's got those challenges. I think what I'll say is many technology organizations offer significant benefits to not-for-profit organizations um, by way of deep discounts or even uh, philanthropic licenses. I know our organization gives 10 free licenses to any not-for-profit organization and any one of our solutions. So, you know, wow. um, that organization, as I said, Excel might be the right answer for, for one organization, but that's an example um, so there is support and resource available, but it's not easy. I, I acknowledge that. Just briefly, Santosh, before I move on to Mark, Monica says, from my point of view, the problem could also be the question of what sort of software should be used to extract and analyze data. Any any thoughts or, or advice for Monica there? Uh, the, the main thing is actually, regardless of which, I won't speak about Salesforce in particular, regardless yeah. of where you go, a platform-centric approach is what I'd recommend. As What I mean by that is, a lot of organizations have gotten in trouble by historically they've procured or purchased solutions for a particular need and not thinking about sort of broad ancillary needs of a function to take a classic not-for-profit um, 
there might have been a decision to get a particular type of fundraising solution, so technology for that specific need. There might have been technology purchased for something around how programs are delivered or even how grants are dispersed. Now, unless these systems are natively or based on a platform that allows them to talk to each other easily, actually extracting information for, for analyzing uh, data and actually drawing insight is incredibly difficult. So this, the starting point is actually having a set of technology principles that says, regardless of what pivots we take in terms of our data needs, we've got a platform that allows easy integration into, I think, you know, Jared had four sort of categories of where data might lie. Let's exclude paper and let's exclude things in your head. Um, oh dear, that's, have, that's me out then. <laughs> we don't quite have technology that integrates really well just yet, but in terms of structured information, it might be in several stores, but going to a platform centric approach rather than specific applications is the safer bet because if your organization needs to pivot, you're not encumbered with a particular platform that just a uh, particular application, excuse me, that can't talk to something else. Um, I'll come back to you in a minute, Mark. I'm just going to flip to Gerard now because I know Gerard, you've got thoughts on culture or platforms and wondering what your thoughts are as to what is more important for data success and whether you agree with Santosh's comments there about platforms. So I certainly agree that having your, your data in a platform is preferable to it being in an application because it gives you more ability to, to use that data elsewhere. Um, I was going to also say that you can try and plan ahead as much as possible, but invariably I've, I've been doing this long enough that you can make the best plans in the world, but trying to plan anything more than six months in advance generally doesn't work. So don't be too disheartened if you, if you pick something and it's not quite right. Um, we are blessed now that the ability to move data around is far easier than it's ever been. Um, that's also part of the reason why we have so many data breaches because people are moving data around. So again, another double-edged sword. But on that platform versus culture, I don't think you can have one without the other. If you have the world's greatest platform, your data is curated to the nth degree and everything is perfect, which all of us on this panel and on the call know that will never ever happen. If your organization isn't ready for that, if people aren't aware that the data is not owned by a department, it's owned by the whole organization, but different people are responsible. If you haven't built that, that culture of really seeing the value in data, it, it doesn't matter what, what platform you have, but then you flip that round. If you are the most culturally data aware organization in the world, if you don't have the right tools and processes in place and your, your data is a mess, it you're, you're, doesn't matter how keen and committed you are, you're never going to extract those, I can't remember who said, I think it was Mark, those golden nuggets of information, those those sort of diamonds you're looking for, you're never going to have to do it. So it it's a cop-out answer to say both. It's why that if any plan that comes along, you have to make sure you're tackling both of those. Otherwise, you, you won't achieve either. Gold dust was Mark's phrase. I've stolen there that we one go. as well. I know we <laughs> use the phrase pixie dust, but I'm liking gold dust now. Um, Mark, <laughs> we talked about uh, education and how you can help children when, you know, when we're all doing remote learning. And you made some really valid points, actually, that... You know, I, I, live, I live in a flat with no garden and it, it's a very nice flat, but we were lucky enough to have computers each or iPads and all that kind of thing. So I was interested, you know, in what you're saying about um, learning in the pandemic. Um, we've seen an increased demand for data and data driven policy making through the pandemic. I think it's it's made companies transition quicker, hasn't it? And realize the, the benefit of, of data. But what are some of the main shifts in demand and, and use of data that you've seen? Yeah, thanks. So, I mean, I, I think COVID accelerated changes that were already underway uh, in the data field. So um, from a government and for us intergovernmental organization point of view, our two main data sources were face-to-face um, uh, -face household surveys and data from administrative data systems, from the health management system, education management system, and so on. And both those data sources essentially stopped. Um, uh, you couldn't do face-to-face -face surveys, and uh, schools closed, so the education system, uh, data system closed, the health system was overwhelmed, so that system. So we were suddenly left without these two main legs that we normally stand on. And the demand, of course, multiplied. We need to know now, where is the pandemic? How are people being affected? Are children more or less affected than others? The, you know, there's, there's instant questions and zero data sources. 
Um, so it, uh, uh, it there was already a trend towards wanting more timely data and data that's uh, useful for forecasting, uh, but that multiplied you know, many fold, and it made us look uh, at um, the quality of the data that are necessary to make decisions. So instead of just a statistical or national statistical office just saying we need high quality data, that, those are statistics. That's what we do. Um, um, it, uh, they changed and, and we have changed to be able to say, well, if we're just trying to decide, you know, uh, which district in the country is worst off, uh, we don't need very accurate data. We just, you know, as long as it's reasonably representative, that's all we need to know. We don't need to know exactly how badly off it is. We just need to know it's worse off than everywhere else. So uh, it changed the way that we looked at data and, um, what it has helped me to do is to concentrate on how do we answer the questions that people have rather than tell people what we think they ought to know. Um, and uh, it, it sounds really dumb, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's really quite a difference. So when you come to, you know, as Jared was saying, when you come to having a great uh, data display or, you know, a platform, that's fine, but great for whom? You know, and, and part of it is what we call the um, uh, what I call in, in our organization data savvy. So it, it's people who are comfortable with using data, who are competent and who are committed to using data. But at the same time, it's having platforms that respond to people. I, I have I have a few little hobby horses in my stable. And one of them is that I hate dashboards. I mean, I love them using them, but most people can't use them. I have a senior manager who every time he's shown an exciting new dashboard, he will say, that's really exciting. Can you summarize it for me in one page? You know, he's not going to look at it. He doesn't have time to go delving and, you know, deep, deep dives and so on. We have to answer what people need to know, not tell them what we think they should know. Um, I'm smiling as I'm listening to what you're saying, Mark, but I'm also smiling because I was about to put this to you, Santosh, from Sandra, which is why don't software providers simply write or adapt CRMs for the third sector? They still get the profit and the third sector gets the benefit of a functional product. And I've noticed that Oliver's written back, hi, Sandra, salesforce.org does just that. More information here. So there's no need, actually. We've got Oliver kind of on a reserve in the backstage virtual stage there, which allows me to ask if you'd like to follow on from what Mark said and how you know, how, how you changed in the pandemic and how you treated data differently and, and what effect that had on your organization. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for us, it, in some ways, it was a continuation of business as usual. So we'd always had a working setup that allowed us to be partly remote, partly in the office. And I think what was really beneficial of having this existing data-driven culture was, you know, within two days, the you know, 90,000 employees of what we are now, we probably were a few, uh, a fewer number two years ago, we were able to pivot quickly. In terms of what Mark was saying, um, I think, yes, expectations have fundamentally changed. Um, there, there is no going back to how things were, and they, they've changed in two dimensions. Um, there's the external stakeholder, and again, I'll, I'll address that broadly. That can be a donor, um, it can be a beneficiary, it can be someone you're just looking to engage from an advocacy perspective their expectations of how they want to be talked to from not-for-profit organizations as well as commercial organizations have fundamentally changed. They have been able to carry on life as normal for two years, um, everything around their health through to supermarkets, through to every single aspect of their life has managed to happen without seeing a human being. So there's an expectation that, for instance, give money, I'm able to do so very simply at the click of a button, et cetera, et cetera. Similarly, and interestingly, we're seeing this with certain humanitarian organizations at the moment. Um, you've got an, a wave of, if you like, um, uh, refugees or people at risk of dis uh, displacement who are actually as tech savvy as anyone you'll get in a well-off Western country. And actually, the way you engage such beneficiaries is probably through technology. And it's actually counterintuitive to think about it that way, where we think of high levels of deprivation and we might think there's a different approach needed. Actually, it might be cheaper, faster, more effective to engage that way. That's the external lens. Internal lens, not to be forgot, forgotten as important as anything else. Employees or staff members, volunteers, people have been working in a very different way for the last two years. And actually, 
in some cases, their jobs were made a lot more difficult. So if an organization didn't have an existing data-driven culture to switch to a remote way of working, probably would have doubled the amount of work they were doing, made it more difficult in some ways. But I think there's an opportunity out of that to think about how, if normal, whatever we, we call this post-COVID world we live in, there's a different way of talking to stakeholders through technology or and other means, and data is at the heart of that. Can we change the relationship between the employer and the employee as well um, in terms of how easy is it for them to do their job? And I think the confluence of the two, making it easy for, to engage this end stakeholder, making it really easy for someone internally to do the work, that's where transformation truly happens. And I think that's our point of view of where, where organizations need to go next. I have one question each left for Mark and Gerard. I was going to do it the other way around, but since you've just said about people, I'm going to flick to Mark because people and organizational buy-in are a massive part of this too, aren't they, Mark? Yeah, and and different kinds of buy-in from different people. Uh, the, the organization I work in, the most important people to get engaged and to get committed are those leading our 130 country offices around the world. Um, because our organization is very decentralized and uh, is geared around the fact that that's where results for children happen. And regional offices and their headquarters are there to help that happen. So it's, it's engaging and inspiring um, those people to see how, for example, data make a difference in what they're doing, both in, in terms of what services delivering and, and, and in terms of policies. And once we have that excitement, that you know, in some ways, percolates up. And and uh, although traditionally we, you know, uh, culture change happens by leadership from the top, um, we it, it kind of happens in both directions uh, in UNICEF. As long as there's enough demand from those people who are highly respected in doing their work, which is directly affecting children's lives, the senior management uh, also uh, buy in and recognize and, and support. So um, it's always just showing this makes a difference. You know, if this helps, then people will want to do it. If it's an added burden, there's no way people will do it. So no pressure, Gerard, but the final comments going to be uh, from you, if that's OK. I mean, the digital area, we all know, is a very competitive marketplace. How does the non-profit sector make sure that they can get ahead and, and hire people who have got the right skills to to use this data in the right way and to be able to make a difference? So the nice, easy question to answer at the end. Thank you, Helen. Um, <laughs> Pleasure. <laughs> it's, it's difficult. Um, we COVID has been a, both a blessing and a curse in terms of uh, recruiting talent in that people can work from anywhere. So before we were, as an organization, very much tied into nine to five, you come into the office and that's how it works. And that made attracting people very difficult because our main offices are, there's one in Reading, there's one in London. Um, when it comes to opportunities for people to work, the, Reading is a mini tech hub. London, we know, has an awful lot of technology. So being able to open that up to anywhere in the UK is incredibly empowering, but that also applies to absolutely every other organization in the, in the UK as well, that they've had that ability. I think for us, it's about, I think, I know from my perspective, I've worked at commercial organizations, I've worked at third sector ones, that there's a reason I'm working at guide dogs. And it's because of the connection to the cause. It's about really being able to make a, not just a tangible, but an, an incredible difference to people with sight loss and allowing them to live the life they choose. So it's about selling selling us as an organization, explaining that, and this comes back to data as well, that, that what they are doing, if you connect all the dots, it's helping, it's dramatically helping someone with sight loss. So whether it's UNICEF, whether it's Guide Dogs, whether, whether it's any organization in the third sector, it's about appealing to um, and nothing against the financial sector. I have many friends who work in there, but there, there's a reason why um, people in the third sector don't get up every day and go and work for a bank. And it's about explaining that. But it, it is a challenge. It's certainly with digital. Um, I think the biggest change coming for the third sector is that two-way relationship with data. No longer is it that someone gives us data, we do something with it, and they never see it. People, as Santosh said, people now demand almost an instantaneous response and creating that two-way relationship is 
entirely dependent on digital services. So it's an interesting challenge, but one we have to meet because we need to meet the, the needs of our donors, our volunteers and our service users. Gerard, you rose to my challenge beautifully and left us on a, a very thoughtful note there. You've all been fantastic panellists. I'm sorry that we didn't get Elspeth from the Magic Breakfast, but uh, thank you very much indeed. It's been uh, wonderful to chat to you today. And uh, on that note, we draw to a close. It has been a really interesting discussion and I'm sure one that we could continue for some hours to come. Our expert panellists have busy roles to get back to, as I'm sure uh, most of you do too. So I'd like to say a massive thank you to Mark, to Gerard and Santosh for taking the time today to share their wisdom and great insights. It sounds incredibly positive for the future with data-driven culture just around the corner for many of us. Our team behind the scenes will ensure that uh, any of the questions we didn't get to in our live Q&A will be shared with our guests so your contributions haven't been in vain, although I think actually we did get to them all. I'm sure many of you have been taking notes throughout the on-demand recording of this webinar will be available to watch back within the next 24 to 48 hours. So don't worry if you've scribbled and you can't read your own scroll, it will be there for you. And thank you for submitting your questions too. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to our panel List today and helping bring this webinar to you. So a big thank you to our speakers, to the team delivering the event and to you for taking the time to tune in and take part. I hope you have a lovely day and I hope I'll see you again at some point. Thank you. Thanks, Helen.